The Belchers on Bob's Burgers may still be struggling to make ends meet. Get it? Meat? But Bob's Burgers The Show is going strong, now entering its seventh season. That means we're due with 107 all new facts fresh off the grill. I'm Adrian, and here on Channel Frederator, we're covering everything from the hubbub around the 100th episode, to its history at the Emmys, to the cast's Comic Con shenanigans. But no cilantro, because cilantro is terrible. Whether you're a diehard fan or just wondering what all the fuss is about, we've got something for everyone as we count down 107 more facts you should know about Bob's Burgers. Let's get started. <laughs> Fact number one. By now you know that Bob's Burgers was originally a show about a family of cannibals. The inspiration for this came from creator Lauren Bouchard's previous show, Lucy the Daughter of the Devil, since he was experimenting with a lot of comedic horror tropes. Number two. Bouchard worried that without the cannibal angle, the show wouldn't be able to differentiate itself from other Simpsonian animated comedies. But its grounded scale and punny sense of humor has already done just that. Number three. The cannibal gag was scrapped, in part, because Bouchard realized that while a married couple arguing about their anniversary while carving up a dead body would be endearing at first. Over time, they'd be making the same cannibal jokes over and over and over and over. Number four. According to Bouchard, the recurring gag of the neighboring restaurant changing ownership is meant to show that maybe Bob's Burgers doesn't have the best real estate. Being lodged between that and a mortuary helps paint the restaurant as a day-to-day -day struggle that gives the show its numerous amount of characters. Number five. It's not easy for the crew to do the recurring storefront and van gags, but as Simpsons fans, it's something they felt they had to commit to. Bouchard said that the Simpsons chalkboard gags feel like little gifts to the audience, and that's something they wanted to bring to their show too. Number 6. To come up with the burgers of the day gags, the episode writer or writing team needs to send a list of 10 puns to Bouchard, who then narrows it down to the ones that sound like they could be actual burgers and not just puns. Number 7. The in-universe explanation for the burgers of the day is to show that, as a small town cook, Bob is truly committed to his business, and shows it by making a new special every day. Also, dad jokes. All the dad jokes. Number 8. Bouchard doesn't like to pick favorites but he singled out the Holmes for the holidays and is this your card as some of his favorite burgers for the classic puns, along with the one fish, two fish, red fish hamburger as a combo breaker. Number nine, what's Bouchard's personal burger of the day? It's pineapple. He's worried because burger purists will be mad about it though. So shh, keep it between us. Number 10, if you're craving more burgers of the day, you can always check out behindbobsburgers.com, the official blog of the writers, where they upload even more lovable cringy and topical puns. Number 11, in high school, Bouchard was in a band with show composer John Dylan Keith. He then quit because he was so completely unqualified to play. His words, not ours. The two of them later ended up working on Bob's Burgers together, which just goes to show that even if you think you're talentless, you can still make an acclaimed TV show. Number 12. Leading up to and including Bob's Burgers, Bouchard has a history of shows with non-cynical father figures. These include Dr. Katz, which he calls a love story between a father and a son, and Lucy, daughter of the devil, which he says paints the devil as a doting Cosby kind of dad. Number 13. Bob's Burgers has never had the same number of episodes per season twice. They had 13 episodes in season 1, 9 in season 2, 23 in 3, 22 in 4, 21 in 5, and 19 in 6. Number 14. Bouchard said that one of the advantages of writing for characters who are voiced by the opposite gender is that it helps them escape the typical tropes associated with being male or female, and forces the writers to be more creative. Number 15. Even though the characters have celebrated years of Christmas, Bouchard has confirmed that the show will always be in a floating timeline, since aging cartoon characters isn't fun. Number 16. According to the B2C infographic, based on the location and square footage, the restaurant property must cost about $4,000 per month. No wonder the Belchers are so poor. Number 17. H. John Benjamin's favorite burger of the day is We're Here, We're Gruyere, Get Used to It. Number 18. Benjamin has an official stance on the cilantro controversy. He's come out as pro cilantro. It's very likely that Bob feels otherwise though. More on that later. Number 19. Bouchard based Bob off both his own father and some restaurant owners he knows in Boston. Austin. Crazy, since Bob is a dad and a restaurant owner. Talk about unlikely sources of inspiration. Number 20. Bouchard frequently compares Bob to Job, as in the book of Job, since he's a well-intentioned guy who just can't seem to catch a break, minus the dead children and boils and all that. Number 21. Aside from Bob's Burgers, Benjamin's favorite burger joint is Shake Shack. He gets the Shack Burger. Come on, where's the pun in that? Number 22. Just as Louise's favorite parent is Bob, Bob's favorite kid is Louise, at least according to H. Sean Benjamin. As he he considers her a solution-oriented self-starter, which he thinks would make Bob proud. Number 23. H. John Benjamin has another role on the show, Miss LeBons, the fourth grade teacher at Wagstaff School. Number 24. 
24. Benjamin Sun is a big fan of Bob's Burgers and has watched all the episodes ad nauseum on Hulu. Number 25. According to Bouchard, there's intended to be a strong implication that Bob's mom is dead. Don't worry though, she's in the great burger joint in the sky. Number 26. Benjamin voices a character on Family Guy named Carl. In the episode Guy Robot, Carl does impressions of Archer and Bob during his stand-up routine, poking fun at how similar all their voices are. Number 27. John Roberts' favorite burger is the sharp cheddar-dressed man burger. Number 28. When John Roberts got nominated for an Emmy, he brought his mom as his date. Adorable. But when your career is built on making fun of your mother, you pretty much owe her that. Number 29. Lauren Bouchard first discovered John Roberts while he was performing his mom act at a now-closed comedy club called Comics. No audition required. Number 30. Every recording session, Roberts demands that the cast order a margarita pizza pie. According to Kristen Schaal, this has yet to happen. Number 31. Dan Mintz, who voices Tina, has named the Edward James Olive Most Burger as his favorite burgers of the day. Number 32. As we know from her Ice Bucket nomination, Tina is a fan of Paul Rudd. Rudd actually voiced her imaginary horse Jericho in the episode The Horse Riderer. Number 33. Incidentally, Jericho the Horse was created by writer Nora Smith, who actually did have an imaginary horse named Oki when she was young. Bouchard thought it sounded like something straight out of Tina's playbook, so they adapted it into the show. Number 34. Dan Mintz had a bit of a fanboy moment when he first met Kristen Schaal in 2009, and was worried that he'd mess up his lines out of nervousness. He didn't, of course, because it's a voiceover. Number 35. Mintz loves the table reads, because it's the first and only time that the jokes hit the cast the way they'll hit the audience. Also, they usually have a waffle truck. Number 36. All of Tina's love interests have had names beginning with the letter J. Jimmy, Josh, Jonas, Jeff, Jordan, with the exception of Nathan. Damn it, Nathan, we're on to something. Number 37. Like H. John Benjamin, Eugene Merman has declared his favorite burger of the day to be we're here, we're Gruyere, get used to it. Like father, like son. Number 38. So here's the TMI portion of the fact video. It's revealed in the episode Moody Foodie that Gene is not circumcised. So do what you will with that info. Number 39. Eugene Merman played a character in Aqua Teen Hunger Force called Dr. Eugene Merman, shocker, who was renamed Dr. Gene Belcher for the 2015 episode Hospice. Number 40. Merman also appeared in another Adult Swim show, Home Movies, which was created by Lauren Bouchard, voicing a character whose name was also Eugene. Talk about being typecasted. Number 41. Merman believes that Gene's actually a lot smarter than he lets on, and that he just chooses to be whimsical and naive. Number 42. Benjamin believes that Bob is probably disappointed in Gene, and doesn't think he's a good enough male heir to the Burger Dynasty. So who's in line to take up the meaty mantle? Our money's on Louise. Number 43. Eugene Merman has appeared on Archer alongside H. John Benjamin in the two-parter Seaton. He played a character named Eugene. Nah, just messing. He played Cecil Taunt. Number 44. Larry Murphy, John Roberts, and Kristen Schaal have all also guest starred on Archer too, because a family that acts together stays together. Number 45. Some of Kristen Schaal's favorite burgers of the day include the Sit and Spinach Burger and the Fig Lebowski Burger. Number 46. Louise's ears were inspired by a character in the anime, Tekon Kinkri, who wears a bear hat. Bouchard felt that having a human wearing an animal hat allowed them to be both a realistic human and a quirky cartoon character, a quality he applied to Louise. Number 47. Judging by the posters in her room, which parody shows like Hello Kitty and My Neighbor Totoro, Louise seems to be an anime fan. This would make sense, considering the origin of her hat. Number 48. Dan Mintz and Kristen Schaal have both appeared in Adventure Time as children of Jake the Dog, TV, and Jake Jr. Number 49. Kristen Schaal had a fangirl moment herself when Nathan Fielder came into voice, er, eh. Uh, Nathan in the episode Beef Squatch. Number 50. According to H. John Benjamin, an actor's mood has a big impact in their improv tendencies. So if he or any of the other castmates are in a bad mood, it will reflect in the kind of improv they're doing. If Bob's typical demeanor is any indication of that, then Benjamin's gotta be at least 30% over it at all times. Number 51. Benjamin typically uses the phrase, get out, to escape from an improvised moment. So if you hear Bob say that in the show, there's a chance you've been listening to some freshly unwritten dialogue. Number 50. One of Lauren Bouchard's favorite improvised moments is between Gene and Bob in the second episode. Gene says that Narnia was written by Salman Rushdie. Bob disagrees, and Gene has to stand by it. It's exactly the strange kind of banter that Bouchard wishes he had written. Number 53. How does the show get such cool guest stars? According to Bouchard, they write the role with a specific person in mind, and then pursue that person afterward. So has anyone actually said no? Well, just wait and see. Number 54. When Sarah and Laura Silverman record lines for Ollie and Andy, they do so in the same booth, and actually actually do step all over each other's lines. That means that, in post-production, they have to treat them as one performer, since their dialogue can't be separated or relayered later. Bouchard insists it's funnier that way. Number 55. Part of the reason movie star Kevin Kline agreed to voice Fish Odor on the show is because his kids are fans of Eugene Merman, and so the two of them had known each other. Bouchard had no idea that his involvement was a novelty, until someone later pointed out that he was notorious for 
turning down roles. Number 56. On the flip side, they did get turned down by Tom Selleck, who they wrote for and who had zero interest in actually taking it. Number 57. Megan Mullally plays Gail, but she's appeared alongside her real-life husband Nick Offerman in Bob Fires the Kids as an in-show couple. Number 58. Gail is a fan of Quantum Leap and Scott Bakula. It's first mentioned in Turkey in a Can and later comes to a head in The Gale Tales, when the kids all write about her love of Bakula. Unfortunately, Bakula does not voice himself. Number 59. The Reservoir Dog scene in the Season 2 episode Moody Foodie received a surprise guest when the production team discovered that Michael Madsen had inadvertently wandered into their building. They rushed out to catch him and asked if he wanted to be in the episode, but the Michael Madsen character role had already been filled. So instead, he agreed to voice a character in Tin Cup. And that's the story of how Michael Madsen ended up not voicing Michael Madsen. Number 60. While the possibility of a crossover with Archer isn't dead, there are some factors that make it harder, like Archer's dependence on pop culture jokes and its more mature sense of humor, both things that Bob's Burgers intentionally tries to stay away from. Number 61. Side note, for a show that claims to stay away from pop culture references, Bob's Burgers episode titles are filled with them. Just take a look at season 7, which is going to include episodes titled The Last Gingerbread House on the Left, Ex Machina, and The Grand Mama Pest Hotel. Number 62. Lauren Bouchard said that if he ever did retaliate against the Archer guys, it would be in a way that is far less fun for everyone involved. For instance, bearing the dialogue of an entire episode of Archer throughout a season of Bob's Burgers so that all the words are there to piece the Archer episode back together. Like those videos of Obama singing pop songs. Number 63. Apparently Bouchard already did this once before. According to Eugene Merman, there's an entire episode of Bones buried throughout season 2 of the show. Number 64. The Wagstaff school colors are blue, white, and yellow. You know, like pretty much every other school out there. Number 65. In the very first episode, Human Flesh, you can see a restroom door in the back that doesn't appear in any other episode. Where did it go? Oh. Number 66. A River Runs Through Bob was the first time the restaurant didn't appear at all during the episode. Except for the intro and outro, but those don't really count. Number 67. That episode used to be titled Sheesh, Cat Bob, which would have been a reference to the episode in season 1, Sheesh, Cat Bob, which itself is a reference to Shish Kebab. That's some inception level punning there. Number 68. In My Big Fat Greek Bob, Dean Dixon is voiced by Jonathan Katz, who also voiced Dr. Katz in Lauren Bouchard's first series, Dr. Katz, Professional Therapist. Number 69. The German title of Bob and Deliver is O oh Bob, Mein Bob, a reference to the O Captain, My Captain sequence in Dead Poet Society. Number 70. In the movie Ted 2, there appears to be someone wearing Tina's magician costume from the episode Presto Tina O. Ted was created by Seth MacFarlane, so it's possible he was sending a little love to his animated comedy brethren. Number 71. The episode Easy Commercial, Easy Go Mercial was once titled Super Bowl, which is about half as catchy and twice as gross. Number 72. Kristen Shaw and Brooke Dillman improvised much of the dialogue between Louise and Janet in the episode Mazel Tina. Number 73. Bouchard had a vacation plan during the Emmys and was worried that if he left to attend the ceremony, he would jinx his chances and be forced to come back a loser. He decided to stay with his family and hear about the results later, at which point his phone exploded with congratulations for Mazel Tina's win. Number 74. The episode I Get Psychic Out of You was originally called Psychic Much? Gotta keep that pun game strong. Number 75. Some of the writers on Tina's Equestronauts comics in the eponymous episode are actually cast and crew members of the show. They include Mintz, Bouchard, Dillahay, Wong, Feast, and Lim. Number 76. The tattoo that Bob gets in his right butt in the Equestronauts can be seen in future episodes whenever Bob's backside is shown. Just a friendly reminder that even in cartoons, tattoos are permanent until, you know, you remove them. Number 77. Season 4's Ambergris was the least viewed episode of the entire show, bringing in only 1.52 million views. Number 78. Oppositely, the highest viewed was the pilot, with 9.38 million views. Hard to beat that. Second highest is Mother Daughter Laser Razor with 6.4 million in season 2. Number 79. The episode titled Speak Easy Rider is an allusion to the movie Easy Rider. The show also played on the same film title in the episode Earsy Rider. Number 80. The one eye Snake's bike gang, who first appeared in Earsy Rider, pop up again in Speak Easy Rider, so the title similarities are probably on purpose. <laughs> And you were worried about the pun pool? Number 81. At the time of the table read, Lil Hard Dad was titled Helibopter Dad. Same thing, different dad. Number 82. Following Itty Bitty Diddy Committee, the characters had some mild redesigns. For instance, Linda began sporting a v-neck instead of a 3 4 button-up shirt, and Bob and Linda's aprons were tied
and a little bit higher on their waist. Number 83, John Roberts was nominated for an Emmy for Outstanding Character Voiceover Performance for his performances as Linda Belcher and Tim in Eat Spray Linda. Number 84, last video we revealed that a chart had to be released to prove that Bob really did have ears under that hair. The Hauntening was the first time that both of Bob's ears were visible at the same time. Number 85, The National recorded a cover of Thanksgiving for Everybody, except for Europeans, but decided to hold off on releasing it after the Paris terrorist attacks in November 2015. Number 86, If you need a National slash Bob's Burger fix though, the band has covered Bad Stuff Happens in the Bathroom, Kill the Turkey, Sailors in Your Mouth, and Christmas Magic. Someone meme a burger after these guys. Number 87, The full-length version of Mr. Fish Odor's The Spirits of Christmas Song was released onto the Behind Bob's Burgers YouTube channel, featuring original lyrics created by Kevin Klein himself. Number 88, Keegan-Michael Key and Jordan Peele have each appeared on the show before, but Sacred Couch was the first time that the two of them actually appeared in the same episode. Reunited and it felt so good. Number 89, in Lice Things Are Lice, a book can be seen in the library titled Everybody Has a Tushy. This book also appeared in Bouchard's first show, Dr. Cat's Professional Therapist. Number 90, due to shifts in the release dates, Stand By Jean was technically the 100th episode of the show to air. Glued, Where's My Bob, was intended to be and promoted as the 100th episode, but was actually the 107th. Number 91. If the saying in Cilantro Burger wasn't enough evidence, Wag the Hog gave more proof that Bob is against the herb. In the episode, Gene says that Bob's alias, Mustache Manny, hates cilantro. Number 92. After being mentioned before in Carpe Museum, Bob's friend Warren Fitzgerald finally made an appearance in Pro Tiki Con Tiki. Warren was voiced by Chris Parnell, who co-stars alongside H. John Benjamin in Archer. Number 93. The Horse Riderer is the second consecutive Tina-centric episode to be chosen for an Emmy nomination. That's what we call playing to your strengths. Number 94. In anticipation for the 100th episode, a trailer was put out for Bob's Burgers Live, the movie, which was directed by Kristen Schaal to promote the upcoming live events. Number 95. For those who don't know, Bob's Burgers Live are shows put on by the cast of the cartoon where they do Q&As and script readings and other various shenanigans. Bouchard says that it doesn't really amount in much extra money and they're doing it strictly because they love it and love the fans. Love you guys. Number 96. The most important part of hitting 100 episodes was remaining consistent. We didn't want to break the mold and accidentally have this thing that didn't represent the show, Bouchard explained. In a way, it's sort of back to basics. So namely, nothing crazy like going to space. Number 97. Incidentally, Bouchard dislikes The Simpsons' run towards episode 100, like their 96th episode, Deep Space Homer, where Homer actually does go to space. Think of it like jumping the shark for animated programming. Number 98. There was, of course, a musical number in the 100th episode. How can you celebrate without? There wasn't going to be one in there originally, but the moment for a duet between Bob and Louise felt so right, and thus we were blessed with Bad Stuff Happens in the Bathroom. Number 99. H. John Benjamin actually co-wrote two episodes of the show, Secret Admiral Iyer and The Landship, alongside Holly Sch Schlesinger. Number 100. Teddy's therapist, Dr. Marjorie, was first mentioned in the episode Crawl Space and was brought up several more times before finally appearing in Glued, Where's My Bob? Number 101. Season 7 is kicking off with a special guest appearance by Amy Schumer, who's appearing in both The Simpsons and Family Guy that same night. It's an Amy Nation animation domination. Number 102. Bob's Burgers has been nominated at the Emmys for Outstanding Animated Program for five consecutive years, beginning in 2012. Number 103. There's a tradition at the Bob's Burgers live shows of live proposals. During the first few Q&As, people were using the opportunity to do big public proposals. The cast and crew caught on and decided to just plan proposals at every single venue. Sometimes the proposals were just H. John Benjamin proposing to Dan Mintz. Number 104. For the show's first ever Comic-Con, they hadn't even gone on air yet. It made them wonder who would actually show up at a panel for a show that no one's ever seen. Turns out, the actors and network had enough cred that, to everyone's surprise, the panel audience filled up. It was a testament to how strong the Bob's Burgers fanbase would come to be. Number 105. John Roberts has a gag he's always wanted to pull at their Comic-Con panel. When the first actor walks out, they're wearing a neck brace. As each person comes out, their conditions get worse and worse, with someone crutches, in a wheelchair, and maybe ending with John in a hospital bed via satellite. Number 106. At the 2016 San Diego Comic-Con, Lauren Bouchard invited all Bob's Burgers cosplayers to a secret meet and greet. His logic was that so many people just sell the convention exclusives later, and that only real fans really deserve them. Number 107. The cast is keenly aware of the Bob's Burgers porn parody, Bob's Boners, and it comes up repeatedly in their interviews. It's one of the effects of the show that they're most proud of. And there you have it, 107 more facts about Bob's Burgers. If you haven't seen it already, you can go watch the first 107 facts video and then let us know which of the over 200 facts are your favorites. Don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss our future 107 facts videos. Thanks for watching and remember, Frederator loves you.